Laura! Marissa! What time is it? It's Divine Mother Earth time! Woohoo! Hi, everybody. This is your co host, Marisa Acachella of Divine Mother Earth time. And I'm your other co host, Laura Eisenhower. Welcome, everybody. So excited about today's show. Oh my gosh, do we have a special guest? Oh, wow. This is like the show of shows today. We have the one and only May Pang. Her documentary is airing now on Amazon Prime, The Lost Weekend. We're so excited to have you, May. I am so excited to be here. I haven't seen you yet. I haven't met you yet, Laura, but I've known Marissa for eons. And so it's yes. a long time. Yeah, May. I actually threw your um, bridal shower, remember? Can you imagine that was uh, a long time ago, too? I know, I'm not I know, mad. I know. I went your wedding. Yep, 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 yep. Oh, my gosh. We go way back. Well, yeah. I'm going to read your bio. So May Pang was born in 1950, the daughter of Chinese immigrants. She grew up in New York's Spanish Harlem. May is best known for her 18-month relationship with John Lennon often referred to as The Lost Weekend, and her subsequent marriage to music producer Tony Visconti. May is also a successful photographer, author, and jewelry designer with her work represented around the world. Her intimate and truthful portraits of John Lennon during their time together are one of significant importance, with rare images of John and his first son, Julian. In addition to working for Apple Records and Lennon, May also worked in music publishing, A&R for Island Records and United Artists. In 2010, May launched her own line of Feng Shui jewelry and subsequently the Linda May Collection, an exquisite range inspired by her mother's extraordinary dress sense. And your mother did have an extraordinary dress sense. Yeah. And she was mm -hmm. such a strong and powerful woman. I loved her mom. Okay, crafted entirely from vintage Swarovski crystals. As John always said to me, it's love that will conquer all. Introducing May Pang. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm excited. We're so excited. Oh, I know. I, I just saw the documentary and it just really moved me so much. I, I just moving through a big lump in my throat and here you are sitting in front of me. It's so incredible, your story. And and what's so interesting, I don't know um, exactly what the distortions were, but there was a lot that was covering up the true nature of your relationship with John. So it must have been so liberating to be able to tell your story. What was that transition like? And how did those closest to you or just the public react to finally getting the truth of what really took place? You know, years ago, when, when John and I split, which you saw the movie and whatever happened there, and I remember him when we were sitting there and, you know, tears are coming down and he's telling me everything. He goes, don't worry. He said, everybody will know the truth about our relationship. And I look back on that comment to him about, you know, that I had with him. And I thought, and because I, I remember saying, sure, okay. Well, I didn't know it was going to take 50 years to find me for it to come out the way it is. Um, I'm glad it's out. I'm glad that... Um, I finally told, you know, the truth about what actually happened. I didn't want to completely come out over the years. I mean, I know I've written the book, but not everybody read it. And it was always one of those, oh, yeah, sure, she was with John. And I mean, I had people really believing that I was only with him for a weekend. So it's uh, kind of interesting in the comments. Now with the movie it is very funny when they say, oh, yeah, you know, I know everything about you. Oh, you do? Okay. So he goes, I don't really need to see. I said, I think you should, just in case. And they come back and they go, I thought I knew your story. I guess I didn't. So yeah. it's yeah. Uh, it's a lot. It is a lot. I mean, it's, it's an, a dizzying, epic love story, May, that um, it's like, it's, it's dizzying, actually. I mean, there's so much going on. I mean, it's here true. you are right? You're this young girl. You're 18 years old. You were a minority among minorities growing up in Spanish Harlem, right? As you right. said, you're Chinese growing up in Spanish Harlem. You have the gumption to get this job at Apple Records. You eventually become 
John and Yoko's assistant and uh, you work with them for a while. Then John starts cheating on Yoko in an effort to control John. Yoko tells John to start dating you. And of course, in the beginning, you said no. I mean, first of all, I, I just want to know, like knowing you and your nerves of steel, you're a young girl, but you like had you were a ballsy girl from the get, right? So what was she thinking? Did she, she totally underestimated you. Did she? I mean, like, well, let me let me let me put it this way. I liked my job. And right. I liked working. So it was not about going. I mean, I'd been with them for already three years working for them. So I saw the ins and outs, the the pros and cons of their whole life. I didn't need to be involved. I like to go home and say, let me put them to the side for once. <laughs> yeah. Let me let me just, you know, I would love to go home, uh, do the laundry, hang out with my friends. So it wasn't like as if I, I was seeing John and I wanted John. And then believe me, there were a few that had been there and you could see who they want. And that was not me. Right. And when Yoko approached me, like, oh, I think you should go out with him. I looked at her and I said, no, I don't want that. She goes, I know you're not after him. And I said, then, you know, I don't want to be part of this. And she goes, no, no, but I think you'll be good for him. And I kept saying no. And she goes, oh, I think you should go out. And she gets up and she walks out of the room. And I'm thinking to myself, what just happened? Where is this? This has become a nightmare, you know? Right. And I thought, I, I can't, I just can't. So can we hold for one second? I see this. Sure. I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> Bye. Was that your that was my partner? Oh, okay. That was my that was my partner in the in the stuff. Um so yeah, so what had happened, um, let me go back. So to go back and for her to, to do this to me, I, I was really taken back. I was crying, literally in the office, yeah, going into tears because I said, What am I gonna do? Mm -hmm. I'd rather work, I don't want to be with John. It's not, not that, you know, uh, there was anything wrong with him. He wasn't, they were still married. I don't right. want that. They right. were having heavy duty problems in their marriage. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be out. I wanted to be neutral. Right. And, uh, and it was really difficult. But it was, and what people didn't realize, and the only reason I ended up going out with him was because then John, who had no idea, because he was being manipulated on the other side by her, she just goes, because he told me later, he goes, yes, yeah, she came in and said, I fixed it for you so you can go out with May. And he's going, what are you crazy? How do you know I even like her? She goes, oh, I know. And she kept pushing it from both sides that finally John said, all right, fine. If that's the way it's going to be, then we're doing it. I'm good. So he chased after me and I kept saying, stop, stop. So it took a while. And then that spark, though, of real genuine connection. What was that? I mean, how did that hit you? Just, I mean, it scared really me. It scared me. It just brought me, I, I was, I was nervous. And that's why in the movie, I talk about how I cried and the whole thing is, you know, after we were together and intimate, because I didn't know where we were going, but it was, but it was lovely. And I had no idea that the next day, I mean, can you imagine that he goes, come in and sit down. I said, where? And I'm sitting. I go, why? He goes, just sit on this. Just sit in front. So I'm sitting in front of him. And he pulls out the guitar and he starts singing. And it was a song that he wrote for me, which is on the Walls and Bridges album. Wow. I love yeah. her. Was it? No. The so um, yeah, well, the song is called Surprise, Surprise, Sweet Bird of Paradox. Wow. Paradox. Interesting. Yeah. You know so I when you read the lyrics, yeah. You well, were what are the lyrics? Headed, though? right oh yeah sorry oh i was just wanting to say you were so level-headed not drinking or doing drugs you were surrounded by it it just seemed like you were such an anchor too like witnessing without being on anything like all the great true i know people couldn't believe that i didn't want to drink i didn't i didn't want to take drugs i just found that here's my here was my choice if you're going to give me a drink or a steak dinner i'll take the steak dinner if you're going to do, um, you're going to give me drugs or you can have a nice outfit, I'll go for the outfit. So it's always something that I would prefer that's going to long, that would be long lasting as opposed to just 
you know, something That's simple. So, so level-headed, May. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. Because, because you were able to take it all in and remember it and, you know, be really present during that time. I mean, it's really a historical moment. I, you know, I never thought of it like that. People would say, because as you were watching the movie, all those different things that were happening and everybody would say, when you were taking photos or, or when you were there, didn't you think it was the most historic moment and this is history? No, I have to be honest. No, because to me, it was like, I'm living every day. This was happening right then and there. And that's what I was dealing with just at the moment, living my life at the moment. Wow. You were going to ask them, Marissa, the lyrics of that song. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah. What so was the yeah, we're, we're just so excited, May. So we're, you know. No, it's okay. I mean, you know, it's sometimes it's hard for me to believe that what I see on the screen, what I'm reading about, it's really about me. Right. Because I keep thinking, oh, it can't be about me. But yet I live through it. And I'm thinking, I guess it is me. You know, it's still, it's still out here. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Wow. I mean, like it's hard for me to think that we've known each other for so many years and we don't, you know, and I, uh, it's over 20 years. 25, I know. It's 30, over 20. 30. I remember the first time I met you. I, I was with Pam. Yeah. That's right. So long, so long, long ago. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be like, singing Beatles songs every time I say something here. All right, I won't do that. <laughs> oh, I know, my gosh, seriously. So I, I, just thinking about just that time of history too, just all the gatherings outside of the White House or the monument and all about just peace and, and ending war and then the electric surveillance. How did that sort of impact you? What were you noticing and how was, John, did that really exacerbate some of his issues with substances and everything? Or, Well, you know, it, it was really work from the working side when I was working for him. Uh, it, you know, it was kind of depressing. I, the people, they just want to keep him in the United States. And, and you know, um, he did everything possible. But at the same time, it was really impossible because we had... Um, uh, Nixon, who wanted him out because he had such, because John had so much influence on the young community, right? So didn't want that guy in town. So it was it was kind of tough. So when I was with him, we had been trying so hard to keep him in the United States. Every time he just want he just wants to he wanted to be here, and he goes and I and I love the 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 line where he goes and I even brought my own money. So it wasn't like as if he was living off of anybody else. Right. And it was hard because he would say, oh, I want us to go here or even to Hawaii. And we couldn't. Even though Hawaii, and I explained to people, I said, even though Hawaii is uh, part of the U.S., part of our 50 states, it was crossing waters, which is international oh. waters. So he couldn't leave the continent then. Right. So the 48 states was where we could be. That was it. Oh. Wow. Because if we got off and anybody wanted to arrest him, they could have over international waters. We could have been on the plane. And, you know, I think, uh, Laura, you would know that true, right? Isn't that, you know, once we got off of that, we're in the international waters, it's free for all. So yeah. we were careful. Wow. Seeing the dynamic with just the other members of the Beatles. I mean, you got to know George. I mean, you got to know really. And then that, All of them, one, yeah. yeah. And then that there are five years of conflict between him and Paul. And then that all kind of disappeared that one time you met Linda and did that last? Well, uh, with us, it did. I mean, when I was around, I mean, I, I was telling um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in New Orleans. And 49 years ago, uh, John and I would have been taking that trip down to New Orleans together. And we were going to surprise Paul and Linda because they had come over the week before or so or a week and a half before and said, oh, guess what? Um, 
you know, uh, we're going to be recording our next album down in New Orleans. And John said, oh, really? So, you know, Paul and Linda used to come over to our house all the time. So it was it was nothing. So they came over and started telling us, well, we're going to be uh, doing our next album down there. And after after they left, you know, uh, I could see John's wheels turning in his head. And, uh, the, you know, and the next day, um, I remember sitting there. I'm on the floor doing work and because we didn't have a proper desk or anything. So I'm sitting on the ground. He's sitting on the bed, which was also our sofa because we, we slept in. We had a very small apartment, um, probably no more than 700 square feet, if at that. Mm -hmm. And um and we're sitting there and he goes, I got to ask you something. And I said, what? And he goes, uh, what would you think if I started to write with Paul again? Now, if I tell you that I was like the exorcist with, you know, my head swung around. I go, what? Did you just say you wanted to write with Paul again? He goes, I said, I think it'd be a great idea. And he said, but why? And I said, well, you know, you guys solo are good. You, you're good writers. But when the two of you get together, there's a magic in there. There's a, there's something that can't be beat. And he goes, hmm, you're right. Okay. You know, you know, um, it's interesting too. It's like the, I mean, nobody knows that everybody thought they were enemies that, that once they broke up, that was it. There was no contact whatsoever, but watching the documentary, it's, it's so interesting, May, how you were like, the magnet that you brought these relationships back into his life, like the relationship with Paul, like his relationship with Julian, his son. Right. Right. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about that, but I also just wanted to say that, you know, uh, if only, you know, that did happen, they were talking about collaborating again. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, people had no idea about that. And the only reason that story's out is because, I've talked about it. No one ever knows, oh, you know, John and Paul were going to re- No one would have known if I didn't no. say it. It was yeah. in my original book. Right. And, no and you know, when we were going to go down to, to see to see them, um, we were going to surprise them. And wow. John was ready. We were talking about, let's get the tickets ready. And, and obviously, you know what happened. So things, yeah. life changed. And my whole world went in another turmoil you know, went to another direction, but, um, but here's the thing. So I remember years later after I got married mm -hmm. and, um, to Tony Visconti. I went, yeah, to Tony Visconti and, mm -hmm. uh, we were, I was in London and it was, um, uh, we were, I was, I was there and I remember going to a party and Paul and Linda were there and Linda was very sweet. And she says, ah, oh, I'm so glad you're with Tony. I always wondered what happened to you. I said, yeah, I'm here. And she goes, oh, that's very good. And I said to her, I said, you know, I just want you to know that when you and Paul visited John and I, we thought about coming to see you down in New Orleans. Uh, she goes, oh, why don't you tell Paul that? I said, no, no, why don't you? T I don't need to tell him. You could tell him. I mean, really, what proof would I have had years later that I'm there, you know, saying, oh, yeah, we were thinking about coming down to see you. Mm -hmm. And he said, she said, no, 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 you tell. So she dragged me over to Paul and she goes, she has something to tell you. So I told him in typical Paul, he says, oh, sure. Oh, that's nice. You know, what else? Mm -hmm. And a year, was it a year later? We were all back in New York. I just remember getting a phone call. And it was for uh, it was from McCartney's office. And they said, Paul and Linda would like to invite you to a party they're having for Buddy Holly's birthday, which they did every year. It's Buddy wow. Holly party. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, when is it? They said, tonight. A lot of notice. I said, <laughs> okay. And I said, where is it? And got the, the notice. And I said, all right. So we go down there. And I remember being there. All these people are there. And I looked over and I saw them coming in the door. They had just flown in. And at that point, I think they just had come in from the being on the Concord. Because back then it was easy. They get they flew in. And I saw them. And they saw me and they came walking straight towards me. And I said, hey, what's great? She goes, 
And he turns to Linda and he goes, did you tell her? And she looked at him. She goes, I walked in the same time you did. How did I have time to tell her? I said, tell me what? You know, he said, um, you know how Derek Taylor always has, who was, if nobody knows, Derek Taylor was the uh, press relations uh, guy for Apple and the boys. And so she goes, you know how Derek is, you know, he always tries to sell some of his stuff and, and things. He goes, we got one of his cards. I said, oh, one of his postcards. He goes, yeah, it was from John to him. I said, oh, that's cool. And he goes, yeah. It said, thinking of visiting the Max in New Orleans. So, so that was proof. Okay, so there you go. You got I mean, but this is the needle in the haystack. This is what I'm saying. I had no idea. So these are wow. the little things that happen in my life. So when people, you know, um, do I know that they're out there? I'm sure there are, but I don't know that until right. it actually happens. So somebody answered. Somebody's watching. Somebody is. I wonder who's watching you from above. I man. don't know. <laughs> So, so, you know, what? the other thing is, May, um, the relationship with Julian, I mean, when you were an assistant before everything happened, you told me the story a long time ago, and it's horrifying how Julian would call and then Yoko would crumple the message and not tell John. Well, you know, the thing was, I, I, I you know, because the last time I saw him, he was in London, well, in Tittenhurst Park, where I saw him, you know, back then. But what was terrible for me was working and he calls, which I'm thrilled because he's now going to talk to his father. Right. And then to be and all calls were vetted by by Yoko first. Right. And the first thing she said to me, I said, oh, you know, Julian's on the line. Get rid of the phone call. And I just sort of like. I just, I was, I was stuck. I was like, I couldn't even speak. I said, oh, okay. And I now had to go in and tell this, you know, 10 year old kid that um, when I said his father was there, it was no longer, oh, dad went out the back way, you know, that type of thing. So I had to make up another story. And it really was tough for me knowing that, that I, that I was lying to him, you know? Yeah. And the phone call, and, uh, you know, the phone call was, it, it never happened as, as you know, it was, I was told this phone call never happened and I couldn't say anything. So what do you think her agenda was when she discovered that this wasn't just a fling and then she seemed to want to insert her control again? What was that all about? Even though she was already kind of controlling. I know. Kind of. But, you know, in my opinion, she probably realized she wasn't as powerful without him at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, it. she went to a concert that I know a friend accompanied her and the driver would say, I have Yoko, uh, Yoko Ono Lennon or Yoko um, uh, Lennon back. And she'd be screaming, Joko Ono. And, and and she just wanted to be known for herself, which I get, and that's fine. But I think the the idea was she realized without him, he she was not going to be that well received and, and known to all the places. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think when she realized that John and I got closer, it was not, it was something that, that uh, she didn't realize we were going to go there. Uh, I know that um, I had heard that she only thought that my time with, with John was only going to last two weeks. Hmm. And so she was quite surprised. I mean, she even got to the point she would say things to him and and he would say, that's fine. May and I are fine. Or, you know, at one point she asked for a divorce, which a lot of people didn't realize, but she did. And it was told... Um, in a lawyer's office because she thought that he was going to go crazy. And um, I remember him coming back and saying, well, I'll be a free man in six months. And I just sort of looked at him and said, really? Are you sure? Are you okay? He goes, yeah. So there was, he was already had moved on. Let's put it that way. So, um, 
I feel like we're going to be sort of jumping chronologically a little bit. Um, so here's, okay, here's Yoko, who, as we know, is very controlling. And um, she's calling, you're having this relationship with John. You go, you leave New York and you go to Los Angeles, right? Right, because we needed to get away. And it was like, we're in New York. We need, it was, and just so that, you know, we didn't move there. A lot of people thought we moved there. We didn't move there. We uh -huh. went there on a, just to have, to hang out. And then projects started to come in. We would always, people didn't realize we actually flew back to New York many times in between. So, so but. Right. And you lived on 52nd Street and then you flew. Later to on. Yeah. Later yeah. on. But in but between, guess what? He stayed in my studio apartment on East 89th didn't. Street. A studio that's probably not as big, no bigger than my, this room, you know, but he okay. loved it. He just loved it. He didn't need to have the big stuff. He was fine. So, so the thing is, so here you are, you're having this incredible love story and you're, you're going back and forth between New York and Los Angeles. You're hanging out with like incredible people. But of course, John is the Beatle. He's like, it. he's, the rock star, rock star. So, and you also, you you also tell that story. It's not in the documentary about Eric Clapton. How you, yeah. right? Which one? The one, the one I talk about. Legendary story. Yeah, it's it's the for, for a brief second because John never thought of himself as when you're saying big rock star. Right. And he never thought of himself as that. So we were watching television, and they were promoting. Madison Square Garden, and it was Eric Clapton. He goes, the legendary Eric Clapton at Madison Square Garden. And John says, whew, I'm glad it's not me. And I turned over to him and said, what's, what's, what do you mean? Because to live up the to the line legendary? Oh, no, not me. And I just looked at him. <laughs> I said, okay. You don't think the legend? He goes, not me. So he didn't think of himself like that. Wow. And and you were witness to Imagine being written, right? No, not Imagine so much. It was already written. I was there for all the films, for a lot of of the filming of the Imagine when he was, um, you know, when he was, when you see the the footage, the video, the whole thing, because I'm in there. I was in England at the time. And uh, and the, the, the carpeting that's in the room that you see where John had the piano, John ordered that carpeting to be brought to America to brought to our new apartment so that that was our carpeting on our floor as well he says I'm not letting it go to waste we just got it in I want it now so we had That's it shipped true. over wow so so back to okay so New York Los Angeles um you're you're living you're having this epic love love story the, this epic love and you've got all these incredible people around you and at the same time you're experiencing experiencing this great love you've got somebody calling you 13 times a day like how did you navigate how did you focus on the love as opposed to like you know and were you talking to her 13 times a day like how did you I didn't have to I, I would say hello or if she wanted something she'd just talk to me but basically she when you look back on it, it's the way to to keep that person in your in your grip, you know. And so, and she did that all the time. And she called. I didn't stop it, and a lot of people would say, "Why didn't you stop it?" Um, it's kind of hard because I know she would say something to John to say something like, um, "Well, you know." Uh, why is she so that oh, she's blocking me when I'm the one that said that you can go out with, you know, she would have had an excuse and I wasn't going to give her that excuse. So mm -hmm. whatever that was going to happen had to come from him and not me, you know? So I believe me, I witnessed a few phone calls that were not so uh, thrilling, <laughs> you know? Sure. Uh, and, and she would call me back and said, why'd you do that? Why did you give him the phone? Well, he was so he was so upset, and he's in a bad mood. Why'd you do that? And I said he wasn't in the bad mood when I handed you the phone. So, you know, it really, um, 
it was a lot of things, you know, it was some things, some things, uh, it, it can't be explained, but you don't want to be there. And I couldn't go backwards. And people have asked me why I didn't uh, tell them about Julian, because it was so difficult. We were working on the now. Mm -hmm. And when you work in the past, it's to bring it up to the now. It takes too much energy because there was so much from the now to the future that I had to work with the now and going forward, not going backwards because it was taking too much energy. Right. right. You weren't working for Yoko anymore at that point. No, not at all. Not. Right. That's just the other thing. I was no longer part of that. You know, it was just I had no salary. I had no uh, income. So basically, you know, John was in a sense, uh, this was boyfriend and girlfriend. And I earned uh, a bit of money from when I would do some of the um, uh, recording sessions and, and contracting, because then I can contract and and I did earn my, my keep. All but right, about the recording sessions. <laughs> okay, number nine, Dream. Oh yeah. You told me that you sang back up on it, right? I sang back up, uh, it's also the band singing the Ah Bawa Kawa Puse, Puse. So what does that it, mean? You told nothing. Me. It, it came doesn't mean to anything? him in a dream. It came to him in a dream. These words came to him. He wrote it down. He goes, I have no idea what it means. He goes, I just heard it in my dream. It, doesn't, it. it doesn't refer to you at all? Not that. Nope. Okay. It just, it was just a dream he had. And uh, which is so typical of John, you know, he would hear things or see things or, and it, he just puts, he could put it down. I mean, I, you know, I'm not that clever or creative you know to see what, what was happening but he was you know um he had a dream about uh, a woman and I, at the time i think he said it, he thought he was like his aunt and you know and, and he and he and he wrote a song around it i mean this man could write lyrics very easily hmm. i mean it's just amazing to watch him write oh my gosh so during all this time was he struggling with substances because he sort of hit kind of like a rock bottom he was sort of no it wasn't out. and that's another myth here's the thing so how'd that all he, play out for for us we didn't have you know i'm not saying that there wasn't any drugs around because somebody would come over and say hey i got that but it got to the point where he really didn't care for we didn't have it around us because here miss goody two shoes as i was called by some people because <laughs> i didn't i didn't take drugs either so he liked the idea that there, that I was straight. He loved the idea that when we go out, that I would be the one to make sure that things were not going to get out of hand and we would leave. So everybody thought he hit rock bottom. He didn't hit rock bottom. He never hit the bottom. We didn't get to that part. But it just, the few times that we went out to have drinks with the friends, you know, with Ringo, with Keith Moon or ha Harry Nielsen, which was the biggest one um you know he was, was out of control different. right he was out right. of control right. so but the person that they're gonna um uh, hone in on was the guy who had the biggest name in the group namely john so it would always come back to him and he got the coverage all the time but when you read about it, it's the same set of circumstances so they keep referring to the same thing that kept going on so it sounded like so for 18 months he was drunk out of his mind he didn't that's not what happened and if it was we wouldn't be able to make the the uh to create the work that he had been doing with all the albums and having his son here and we were doing you know he was he was just in the moment he was we were having a good time so when you so that's why my photo exhibition um when you look at it, you see all these pictures of him and people say it doesn't match up to the storyline that's out there. It doesn't. So, May, when exactly, because people will be, I think we're going to probably get this up tomorrow. So where is the photo exhibition and is it traveling? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, for the last uh, seven, eight months, mm -hmm. uh, I've been traveling to different cities. I wanted, I, I've been uh, working with this guy named Scott Siegelbaum, who had been after me for over six years to exhibit my my photographs. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because when I took these photographs, I never thought in a million years that we're talking about iconic or anything. 
I never thought they were going to be hanging in an art gallery. You know, it's these were my home life photos. You know, this story on each one. So, uh, so it's it's a lot of fun. But it's at the in the next um, next weekend. I'm in Florida. I'm at uh, in Boca Raton, and uh, we're going to be at the. Hold on, I have to. I don't even know sometimes where where I'm at, so I have to look it up. It's okay. terrible. And um, and I know a lot of my friends are coming, like uh, me. Yes, and you better be there. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm excited. Hold on, I'm gonna tell you because I I keep it on my calendar. That's the only way I could do this. Uh, where am I? So next week, I'm gonna be at the Kes K E S H E T Gallery. I don't even know how to pronounce it. At uh, on Glades Road in Boca. Okay, and then right the, near me. Yeah. So then on uh, the following weekend, we'll be at the HW Gallery in Naples, Florida. Wow. So those are the two galleries that I'm at to next. And it's um it's gonna be fun. I have a lot of friends that I didn't realize that live down in Florida. They're all going, I wanna come. When are you gonna be there? You know, so um I can't wait to see everyone because I I'd be having fun. And of course, you know, I'll be staying with our mutual friend Pamela. Down I know. There. So I can't wait to see her too. I know. She said the same thing. So it's <laughs> great. So, you know, it's it's a lot of fun. And especially when you have friends that you haven't seen in a long time, it's good gathering. Yeah. Um, and I I'm I'm really excited. Uh I'm just glad that a lot of them had seen the movie. And uh and been waiting because they've heard me talk about it, but I couldn't describe, I couldn't show it. And mm -hmm. finally it's out. So people can actually go see it, you know, and it's uh, a lot. And I'm thank you for, for watching it. And Laura, I know how much you um, were so taken by it. So thank you for all your comments too earlier. Oh yeah. Well, I might just make it to Florida. I hope that's all right. Please come. Yes, Laura, Please. come, come, come. What, what do you mean? You better come. I would love to meet you down there. Yay. So have fun. Oh. You can have fun. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That would be great, Laura. Yeah. And I know you have to see the people when they come down, when they buy um, certain pieces and they go, because each one carries the story. And there so is. Are they for sale, the photos? Oh, yeah. All of them are for sale. Wow. Everything is for sale. Mm -hmm. And um, they can look it up online. Um, it's on the website uh, of, of, of my business partner here. Um, and it's rockartshow.com. Mm -hmm. And they can look on, uh, they can see my photos that are that are being displayed up. We'll put the link up, May. Anything okay. you want us to post, we'll do. I'll send, I'll send it to you and you could, you know, could do that. And it's great because people come in, they when they look at the pieces, they go, oh, what's this like? And they have the story of each one, you mm -hmm. know? John's favorite uh, uh, photograph is in there. Which Everybody's asking if I have a favorite. I don't because they're all my kids, as I would say. They're all my babies. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's hard. But mm -hmm. he had one special one. And this, I had no idea um, mm -hmm. that he liked it so much that he wanted the the picture the photograph and he said i want to use it for the 45 if anybody remembers what a 45 is the mm -hmm. sleeve because they used to have a sleeve for it and it was going to be for imagine that was being released in england and he wanted that picture for because he said i love it and i said why do you like this picture so much and he goes it's my sweater it's my aaron sweater you know his irish sweater that's what and motivated him for it. Wow. So he used that and it's uh and I'm just and I was thrilled. So even Julian's latest album mm -hmm. called Jude, mm -hmm. I took that photo. You did so I have a father and son, yeah, I have a father and son wow. album here, you know, the covers. So I'm thrilled. Wow. Yeah. Gosh. I just find it so amazing that this all started with you confidently saying, Oh, I know how to do that. I know how to do that as far as the uh, what they wanted for an assistant. And and then you just went right in there and, and you just thrived and you just, it all came into place. It's just incredible. I, I and, wanted to learn. I never wanted, you know, it, sometimes nowadays when you talk to somebody, 
they'll say, how do you do that? And they said, okay, it's this, then you got to learn for the rest on your own. And it's like, duh, you know, uh, I don't know, Th this day and age, not everybody wants to, to do that. Or I have ones that go, oh, I'm late all the time. And they just moved it up early. And I'm going, well, why don't you leave a little earlier to get there? They, it's like, they're not, they're not thinking. Like when May, we were, we were more motivated back yeah, then. Yeah, May, you always had such common sense and you were always fearless. Like that's the thing about Don't you. ask me now, I'm not as fearless as I used no, to you're be. No, you're fear no, you're pretty fearless. You know what we really want to ask you about is um, when you were living in New York City on 52nd Street, right? You know what I'm going to ask because <laughs> we, we got to go there. The UFO sighting. Right. We have some we've we got some questions, May. OK, so, so tell us what happened. And then we, we want to sort of we want to, you know, ask a few things about that. But can you tell us the story of how it happened? Yeah, I mean, it was a Friday night and everybody's, you know, everybody's thinking, you know, when I tell this story, everybody goes, what were you on? Well, if anybody knows me, you know, I'm not on anything except food. <laughs> That's what I was going for. And it was a Friday night and it's summer. We're talking summer in the city and where we lived and where our apartment was across the street from where Kissinger lives. So you know that that whole area is like nobody's going to be around because mm -hmm. it's it's the summer. It's Friday night. So anyway, John, uh, I was ordering pizza and from the other room. Right. And John went out to the balcony because it was it was really hot. So he's standing out there. And with his uh, cigarette, he smoked these French cigarettes, and uh, and he's that he's out there and he's looking at the river, and he's enjoying it because it reminded him of Liverpool, you know, the Mersey, because he, he's right by the river. So all of a sudden, I'm in the other room looking to find something put on for the pizza boy, and he's going May, and he's yelling out for me, and I'm going yeah yeah, I don't pay attention. And then it went on and he, and he yelled again. But the second time, the urgency in his voice, I just said, what? Uh, okay, so I come running out. And I said, what do you want? And I stopped mid-sentence and I'm looking. I went, and I'm just doing this. And he says, you're seeing what I'm seeing. And it was this thing, a circular saucer on the rim, uh, on the edges was... Um, a, a white light going on and off, you know, just doing this flashing around the, the rim and one solid red light on top. Wow. And I could see underneath the, you know, the heat waves when you see a, a, the ground being very hot and you see these waves all the time. I mm -hmm. could see that underneath the ship and all around it. It was just, it was just there. And I'm like, oh my God, I could see this. And wow. then, um, and I, and it was so close. Uh, I would say it was only like two to three stories above our heads. Whoa, that close. How that big close. was it? How big uh, was that? I couldn't, I didn't understand about, I mean, um, the size. I asked John that too. And he said he felt like it was a size of a two-man Learjet. So okay. it's not very big, but it's big enough, you know, that maybe two people are in this thing. So it's mm -hmm. circular. So we're watching it and I'm going, oh my God. And I watched it, we, we watched it go from, no, mind you, there was no sound to this thing. I could hear the noise below me mm -hmm. on the, uh, all the, all the cars below me. I could hear across the river, mm -hmm. the thing that was sitting above our heads, there was nothing. And um, the, the reason that John took notice of it at first was, He's as he's looking down river from his from the balcony, he says, Oh, what's these flashing lights? And because that's from the rim. So he's flashing lights and he's going, Oh, it's probably from the billboard sign. And then he just sort of stood, he goes, What billboard sign? He goes, We live in a residential area. What it what, what so as he turned, this thing was right over his head. And it was going very slow. Uh we saw it do different speeds. We saw mm -hmm. it go fast, we saw it stop. We saw it go sideways, flying below rooftop. Um, we saw it do all sorts of, and, you know, flying from, from over the, the rooftop of the other building. So we saw this and I, I kept watching it. It would go around the building, it came out again. And I'm like, oh my God, what is this? 
So for about 10 to 15 minutes, I watched it go down now as it's going down the East River and it sits over the Waterside Towers, which you know where that is, 23rd Street, Marissa? Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's, so, you know, it's right over there, goes around past the UN. We were laughing about it. It's going past the UN. Right. And it went down to 23rd. It sat over the top of the building for a couple of minutes. Now, it's only reason I knew what it was because I watched it. Now, uh-huh. if I was just coming in and said, there's that, there's a UFO, I would have told you you were crazy because you can't tell the difference. It mm-hmm. looked like anything out there. So then I watched it move over the bridge and it's the Williamsburg Bridge. And when it got to the Williamsburg Bridge, I kept saying, it's going to Brooklyn. Who do we know? <laughs> Who can we call? <laughs> and um, I remember it, it just went over the bridge and stopped. And then it went straight up, gone. I watched it go straight up. So why do you think it appeared to you and John? I mean, did, and did you get any messages or anything? No, we were just, I don't, we didn't get any messages, but we were excited to be the ones uh, to see if we called, uh, we called different people and a a couple of people said, did May see it too? (laughs) And the only reason that I got called out at first he saw it and he goes, Oh, it's all me. And then he realized, he goes, May's not going to believe me either. I got to call her out too. So I was like his witness to it, you know, so it's all a chain reaction here. And then, um, and I think whatever it was, we had people call the uh, the police station and we and call the local newspaper. Forget about the Times. Nobody called the Times. Right. They called the uh, Daily News, I believe. And, uh, but it was not enough uh for to make a big story of it and we're definitely not saying it's john lennon that saw the you know there's a what what were you on you know so you can't so you weren't going to say that but definitely people saw it and it made sense because somebody said they had seen it uh apparently i think one of the stations said somebody had reported they had seen something on 87th by the river so that made sense because we were on 52nd by the river so it was obviously traveling down wow Wow. Yeah. What year was that? 1974, August 23rd at around nine o'clock at night. Uh-huh. Pitch black out there, you know, and so all of a sudden up oh, there. And I could hear the helicopter that was across the river going by, but I couldn't hear this thing that was sitting right over my head. Oh, wow. Um... I mean, I'm, you know, when you think, I always believe that we can't be the only people in this universe or whatever universe that we're in. But I also, if it, if I had any doubts, it definitely put that right out of my head because this is what I was seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Laura's family has a history of uh, Val Thor. <laughs> well, you know, and that's what I mean. And for people to, to think that we are the only, that, you know, I mean, I had more people trying to say, yeah, I'm sure it was, uh, you know, uh, the, the government had uh, secret, whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, you got to be an idiot if you think the government had this time. If they did, we wouldn't be where we are either. You know, you, the the idea, no, no matter what, there was no noise. There was nothing. We watched it speed going up, down, sideways. Wow. You know, and uh, it was quite interesting. So, and we were not high. That's the first thing they would ask. What were you, Jane? Me, not you. Me, yeah, really. You don't, you don't right? smoke. You don't do drugs. Yeah. I was so hungry for the pizza. So I was like, oh, <laughs> God. Wanted... <laughs> that's so, so funny. Yeah. So that was it. So that's where I was at. You know, where's the pizza? So I was uh, excited for the pizza. But I was even more excited when I saw this thing hanging over my head. Yeah. And I said to John, and I would tell people, and I said, if Reggie Jackson could, and, that, and those were, that's how far back, if Reggie Jackson could hit a home run, he could hit this thing. That's how close we were. Wow. We were yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So it must be really difficult to talk about this and want to be careful just how I ask, but I mean, the events leading up to 
when he was shot right outside of the Dakota? What, how, how, I mean, can you take us into that a little bit? Is that really, it's got to be so painful to talk about. You know, uh, you know, that's why when I was doing the film, that was one of my concerns because I, I didn't know how they were going to take care of that part of it for me, you know, and the transition. And um, Richard did a great job, Richard Kaufman, um, when he when he transitioned at that moment, how it was going to happen. For me, I remember being on the west side, not far, happened to be on the west side, not far from the Dakota. I was having dinner and um, and the radio was on. And I remember hearing someone talking about, oh, someone breaking news, somebody just got shot, supposedly it might be John Lennon. I said, no, you know, I bolted. I was like, what are you talking about? What am I hearing? I called up a friend. I said, did you hear this? He goes, yeah. Oh, you know, maybe not, you know, maybe it won't be. And, and next thing you know, it was like, he died. Yes, it was John. And I was like, freaked out totally. I ran home. I never even had the dinner. I just ran home ran out of there, got a taxi. And I said, don't go by the Dakota, please. And you know, all that. And they go, what's wrong? They, I told him and the guy was like, what? Mm -hmm. So when I got back to my my apartment, I, my phone was ringing and it was, um, I picked it up and it was Joan who was Ringo's executive secretary at the time. And she said, May, give me the phone number of the hospital. And I just said, forget it. He's gone. And all I heard from her was, what's wrong with your bloody country? I got to hang up and talk to everyone now and tell everyone. And I just remembered going, it, it, it was almost so surreal to the point where I said, who else do we, do I know who that I can share this with that, that knew John, you know, with me. And one of the first people I called was um, was David Bowie, mm -hmm. and I reached his uh, his uh, PA, Coco, who lived there with him. But he was out on a date, and I said, "I'm sorry, Coco, for waking you up because it was already midnight. And she was asleep." I mm -hmm. said, I "Just want you to know that um, John died, you know." And I told her the answer. She goes, "She goes, David's out on a date." She goes, "But I'm going to find him." She goes, I don't want you to be alone. Come down here now. And so I went down and um, I was at the apartment and she found David and he came in and he was just in bits. He goes, he goes, what's wrong with everybody? What is going on? So I just re remember that we, the three of us were watching what happened that night, you know, on television because nobody could, we couldn't believe it. It was just too unreal, surreal. So I thought the way that was handled in the documentary with the animation and Walter Cronkite was really great. In fact, you know, as an artist and a cartoonist and an animator, I totally appreciated it. And I loved, can I say, I loved John's drawings. Yes. You know, the drawings where he, um, where he gave, bought you the Barracuda and he's, and he, and there was, a sketch of him in the back. You said, this is how John felt about my driving. And there he was like, help. <laughs> Mind you, I don't know why, because he's the one who had the accidents. Oh, <laughs> the really? One, yeah, he had he had terrible accidents early on. So I did most of the driving. So there was one time we were in LA and he, I think it was the 101. I don't think huh? it could have been the 101 or the 405. Either one, it's kind of, it's kind of scary on those highways. And right. he said, I want to drive. And I remember standing there thinking, you want to drive? And I got nervous. So I let <laughs> drive for a little bit for about 10 minutes. And he's on the highway with one arm out, you know, and he's doing this. And I'm like, and I turned to him and I said, just tell me when you want to uh, pull over. And I'll take, <laughs> take the wheel from you. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, I let him drive for a little bit. So it's Funny. fun. Yeah. Is that Maybe. Barracuda still around? <laughs> Don't know what I, I gave it to my girlfriend because I couldn't bring it back to New York. Because uh, there was no, you know, 
we we had a car here and to bring it back, what were we going to do with it? So we didn't bring it back here. So I, I left it to my girlfriend, uh, Chris O'Dell. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she used it for whatever. And she said to me the other day, what did I do with it? I said, I don't know. I don't know what you did with my car. So we have no idea where it went off to. So, okay. So back to the documentary, right? So right before that happened, um, Paul and John were going to get together. They were talking about, or John at least was talking about working with Paul again. Yeah, right. which really Paul did not know. We were going to surprise him. That's right. why. In yeah. New Orleans. Okay. Yeah. And then um, you said that you um, you did, you still were in con contact with John. Do you, was there any sense that you were going to get back together with him at that point? Or we were you, or what do you think? I mean, after he stepped away for a little bit, right? Yeah, and you know, he he stepped away and it was, you know, he would call out of mm -hmm. the clear blue. Um the first the first year that we split, we saw a lot of each other. Um mm -hmm. second year, you know, it diminished cuz he was he was going through I could see the changes and I and I would never in a million years pressure him because he needs to make these decisions right uh one of the last times i saw him um mm -hmm. he came over to the apartment and he said you know what i've been listening to this song and i don't know the title of it and he would hum it for me and i'm looking at him and he goes why i said somebody asked me about that same song this week too so it turned out to be the song called reminiscing Okay. Which was written by the Little River Band. Uh, walking through the park, yeah. Yeah. Walking and through the park time. and reminiscing. Okay. Right. Those words reminded him of me, okay. of us. So, so I said, oh, I said, is this it? And he goes, that's it. That's it. I must have played it 10 times over on the, on the record player because he just wanted to keep hearing it. So uh, he goes, that just reminds me of you. So it was, so these little things. So the last time I spoken to him, he called me from Cape Town, South Africa mm -hmm. uh, in 1980, uh, Memorial Weekend. And uh, we were just, uh, we were, you know, we were, we were talking. I said, what are you doing down there? He goes, well, you know, it's the Yoko wants the East meets West trip. So I'm here in, in Cape Town. He goes, it's fun. And, you know, traveling. So I'm thinking, it makes no sense to me, but that's okay. And he goes, he did say, he goes, I'm trying to figure out a time and how we're going to catch up with each other. Because he lost track of time for us. So right. um, he goes, I'm trying, I'm working that out. So what do you think that, let's see, what do you think that meant? Did you, I mean, that's kind of a loaded thing to say. Yeah, but that's where we, but that's where we were. We were about to, I knew that that was, it was, I would say, are you okay? And he would say, yes, I, I could tell the difference. And uh -huh. the fact that he would call me, mm -hmm. you know, John had a habit. Um, John's uh, thing was, if you're no longer in his life, you're no longer in his life. Right. Obviously I was still in his life and it was right. like, I've, I've seen things I've seen, uh, writings and I know I've heard from other people and uh, Larry Kane for instance who um, who's a DJ down in um, in Philadelphia and you know he told me later he says I which I had never known until much much later he said um, John used to tell me his happiest times were spent with you mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. so so in his life so obviously I occupied the time. And so when he says something like that, uh, whatever John said, I understood it. We were supposed to be, you know, we, he was going to try and work something out, however it may be. So, um, but it was never meant to be. So, uh, so I keep him in my, my memory and I pass on the good stuff of John to everyone. And that's mm -hmm. really what it's about. So when people come down and they go to the photo exhibition, you get a chance to, like I say, you can take John home. You can see the John that I 
saw. You're going to see him the way I saw him when you see the photos. And that's what I can give. I give pleasure. I, I can't tell you how many people come in. They go, I've never seen John look like this. He's smiling and he's this and, you know. Accessible and he's warm and he's inviting and he... And he, you could see he clearly likes being around people. He's a people person, which we didn't yeah. know. Yeah, because that wasn't the way it was in the other household. So it's right. each household was different. Right. So I know that uh, I was very, very lucky. Um, I was, um, you know, I was, I was glad. I mean, George Harrison even said, I'm just glad you were with him. You know, that came out of nowhere too. You know, so there's... Yeah. And he turned around and he said to John, I'm glad she's with you. Wow. Yeah, I know. I was like, okay. So it's good. It's so everything is good in that pictures. sense for whatever. Yeah, those wow. are the sweetest pictures with the two of you. And this can't wait to see the photographs at the gallery. Wow. Because when they're blown up, it's a little different than just being in a book on a page. When you mm -hmm. see it, it really, it just speaks to you. He speaks to you. Amazing, May. I mean, I, we both love the documentary so much. And uh, I'm so glad that you did it. And it's 50 Thanks. years, right? 50 years later? 50 years later, here I am doing, I did that, you know, came out last year, you know, more to the masses and it's 50 years. And, um, like I said, John used to say, oh, everybody will know about us. Like I said, I didn't think it was going to take me 50 years. Well, congratulations. Oh, it's I know. Epic, it's epic, epic, beautifully it's really done good. documentary. I'll it's, be watching a few times. That's a gift yeah. to us. Yeah. And I'll be seeing you guys soon. Yes, yeah. next week. I, I, the minute we get off the call, I'm going to start looking at flights. I'll be giving you a call, Marisa, to discuss how I can make this happen. And I can't wait. Um, so have you, what, what, what was it like, you know, after he passed, did, was there just, did you stay in touch with a lot of people? Did you just move? I mean, I saw, what, I still, I stayed in touch with a, a, a number of them for a little bit. And then, um, and then, you know, as time goes on, you know, there, there are sides to be chosen. So, you know, I understand all of that. And um, I don't, really have bitterness you know it's whatever they want to choose i can't i can't make up other people what they do i can only take care of what i can do you know, and uh, that's yeah. where it goes you really like that's the other thing may you really don't get in you're not bitter you just say state the facts and you know the and wisdom really and integrity is the high road. yeah you know what what good would it do Right. This is the thing. What good would it do if I stayed bitter right now and say, I'm gonna get at it. I'm gonna yeah. it won't be good for me and the and the soul, mm -hmm. you know. I'm not mm -hmm. saying I don't get angry. I do and I look back and I'll say, but it has to be that fleeting moment. I can't have that hanging on to my life because then it won't then it wouldn't do me any good for anybody. You know what I mean? I could love somebody for the rest of my life and I could I could also not like somebody and but not liking somebody, that's fine, but I don't have to dwell on it, you know? That's mm -hmm. here. And I know people that, oh, when they see the name or whatever, they get all bent out of shape. And yeah, we can. But mm -hmm. is it going to do me any good? Who's it hurting? Yeah, and it's wasting your energy and time. Energy. Which is precious. Like yeah. how many minutes are we on this planet anyway? Exactly. So the, to me, it's not worth it. I'm right. much happier just... Uh, being with friends when I say, let's go out and I want to see everybody, meet everybody. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I do the the shows. I want to be and, and hang with everybody and talk about things. And there's more to come, you know, but I, I can do it now freely in the sense of where I feel comfortable. It took a while, but now I feel comfortable now to doing it. And you know what? I just don't want people to think that, um, you know, John could be a jerk. There's no two ways and he'll admit to that. But at the same time, he also was a different human being when he was with me. Well, yeah, we really see that. It's really beautiful, I have to say. Yeah. Wow. Thanks, Marissa. Thanks, May. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing both of you down there. I have friends coming in on Saturday. So if you guys just 
just saying they're Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So, you know. Well, I'm here, so I'm around. Oh, yeah. I'm available. Oh, yeah. Laura. Good. I'm Laura, coming. it's your turn. You're going to have to show. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, May. I look forward to seeing you next week. And Good. congratulations on this incredible, incredible journey that you documented for in one of the best documentaries, if not the best I've ever seen. And I uh, wish I could have been in the Oscar contention, but uh -huh. didn't, didn't make the cut. Didn't make the, I was I was uh, eligible, but I didn't make the cut because oh. they only choose 15. And they're mostly, a lot of people don't realize that my movie was independently made, not a studio made. Well, you that know, so counts for a lot because the studios really do push, so. Oh, do they ever push? As so, we know, yeah, I'm on the Writers Guild. Believe me, I see the pushing. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm glad that, you know what, that I made an honest film and that's where it was going. And uh, I didn't have the studio hanging over my head because there was a lot of people that said oh you know we were looking for seed money on this and money for it mm -hmm. and I know that if uh some people would say well if we get do we get any say in it mm -hmm. my directors they had the say they knew what I want they would have been left out so they I, they said no no can they would not take anything that was going to change the parameters of what we were agreed to always better to have integrity and maintain your voice yeah so that's what it is. I won't see money for a while, but this was a great thing for me to do. Well, everybody watch it. The Lost Weekend. Um, yeah. Incredible. Really just have that true story out there like that. Can I ask one more question? What What was yes. it for friends and family as you developed this relationship and moved into this position, being their assistant? How did How did just friends and family react? Like, wow. <laughs> I, let me put it this way. Because I'm the first one to be born in America on either side of my family, the only one that was in my corner was my mother. Nobody else, not my father, nobody else even understood what my life was about. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter to them. So it's only my mother. And the, the only thing my rest of my family cared about was she's not married. Can you imagine that? All that they only cared about. She's, she was, I was over. I was over 30 and they were like, oh, she's getting old. So, oh my gosh. wow. Yeah, that's all they cared about. And I'm sitting there going, I didn't care if I never got married. You know, it, it got to the point that um, that's all they cared about. My mother, my mother got there after they pressured her too, but it wasn't as intense. She was the only one in my corner. Your mother was really happy when you got married though. I remember oh, that. you think? Oh yeah. <laughs> and then I gave her her first child. Her first grandchild was a son, which is very important. And then I had the, my next, my next child was a girl. So it was as in, you know, and in Chinese it's ho. They both stand for good. It's, it's, you know, a boy and a girl can't ask for better. Nice. Yeah. And my daughter just got married. Oh, congratulations. Oh, congratulations. That's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. That's to show you how long we haven't seen each other. I know, I know. The last time I saw you was 2019, May. Oh. And it was All right, I'll see you this weekend, though. I'll so see this you this weekend. weekend coming up. Yeah, it's coming. Wait, this All coming right. weekend? No, not this weekend. Oh, no, no, weekend next after. Week. Oh, okay. Next, next week. All right. Next week. All right. Wow. Well, send me the link when you when you post this up. So I Yeah, know. we are. We're going to post it in... Like we're we're going to add our animation and then our logo, but yeah, we'll right. Back. And then okay. I'll now pass it on to everybody else too. It'll be I'll in the share. next day or so. Okay. Right. Thank you so I'm, much again, May. Thank this you. Huge. I will that. talk to you and I'll see you. Yes. Absolutely. Oh God. Thank you so much for your time okay. and for your beautiful journey and everything. I can't wait to meet you in person. This has just been yeah. Incredible. And then you could ask me some more. Yay! <laughs> I don't think the sure. questions will ever stop. I know we, we didn't want go. to stop, but I mean, we know you've got a, a lot of so things inspiring. to do. So. All right, thanks so again. You, yeah, we'll see you then. All okay. right. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you next time on Divine Mother Earth Time.